perhaps I should ask for assistance in fighting the technology. <laughs> yes, let me go for it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so apologies for parachuting in at uh, this juncture, uh, but I hope that it's of use and that there are some elements of uh, the presentation that uh, I think will build on, on what's been mentioned already. And uh, I did take a bit of liberty of this paper in joining two issues together. One, the potential for a static uh, uh, market uh, in ethanol. And the other one, I thought there were very interesting elements from my time. I spent five years as an uh, international affairs manager for South African sugar sector and uh, secretariat for the SADC uh, Federation of, of Sugar Producers. And I thought that elements of that model were very interesting. And they are also elements that could underpin such a market. So I thought it would be nice to, to capture those in, in a paper and put them out here. Um, so this is the overview of the presentation. Uh, I thought I'd start with what's happening globally with ethanol. Uh, have a look at then some of the basic questions that I think uh, spring to mind when one looks at this topic. Uh, why develop a, a, a market in the region? Um, and then specifically, why use this particular feedstock as a feedstock for ethanol? Um, I'm sure as colleagues are aware, there's a number of other competing feedstocks anyway. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, the answer to that is where I can bring in elements of the model that I thought could be useful. Um, and then key constraints. Um, for this paper, I, I spoke to some members in the, in the sector and uh, uh, Literature Review did some interviews to get a sense from players in the sector, what are the constraints that they themselves uh, uh, view as, as key issues? And then what actions could we take to make this a reality? And uh, if I can just digress a tiny bit, uh, I've had the blessing or luxury of, of, of uh, working in government uh, and labor movement, NGOs and, and private sector and doing consulting. Um, and now I'm uh, back in the NGO uh, universe. So it's, it's occurred to me over the years that this, these questions we've been asking now are a, really relevant. You know? Why exactly are we perhaps failing to deliver? Um, we could be uh, granted some luxury in, in not perhaps achieving what we'd, we'd set out to do. I don't think many regional integration arrangements globally have got it 100% right, but it has been a fair amount of time that's elapsed, and we could certainly be further along the path uh, considering the resources that we've applied to it uh, over the decades. So I thought this is a nice use for example of how practical collaboration between government, regional institutions and private sector uh, can, can bring something to pass and some of the interesting facets and underpinning the sugar sector that have enabled this to occur. So just to, to set the scene, um, what, what sort of dynamics exist globally with fuel ethanol? Um, you'll see that the, the market is expected to grow quite significantly by 2020 and the average blending rate should be uh, roughly about double by 2020 from where it was in 2013. Uh, blending being the percentage of ethanol that you would blend with gasoline slash petrol uh, for use in the vehicle itself. And that blending rate can, can range from 2% all the way up to 100% if you have specific vehicle technology or engine technology, I should say. Um, so in terms of feedstocks, uh, sugar cane, and uh, that includes uh, ethanol from molasses, is by far the largest, uh, funnily enough, because we hear so much of, 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 May, I mean of uh, corn and uh, the US and the US market and interests like that. Uh, so those grains, corn falls under the grains, of course, it's only 33%. And then you have a range of other feedstocks which comprise the, the remaining minority. Uh, unfortunately, the cellulosic uh, biofuels, in other words, extracting ethanol from grasses, from wood chips, from other uh, non-traditional sources, that is still very much in its infancy. Um, I remember every year I used to go to the International Sugar Organization Conference in London, and we would have this five-year joke where people would come and present on cellulosic ethanol and say, we're just about five years away uh, from cracking it. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the research and the other technical considerations are still uh, bedeviling those efforts to get it right. Um, in terms of production, we've seen quite an increase in the, in the last decade, the number of countries producing commercially, now up to 60. And that does, of course, include South Africa and players in the SADC region. Um, in terms of key producers, you've got a handful of key producers globally who really are the, the key market players, and then key consumers, the US and Brazil, 
And within SADC, Mauritius is perhaps the best example of a diversified market, of a sugar industry that then went into biofuels production and also co-generates co electricity. And they are the best example of what the industry likes to see as its future, a triple st revenue stream model, where you have sugar, you have electricity, you have biofuels, all uh, targeted at the same time and all hopefully carrying each other uh, according to different market conditions at different, uh, at different seasons. Um, in fact, to the point where uh, it's pretty much uh, seen as, as uh, a hindrance to your survival if you only focus on sugar uh, as a sugar industry um, globally. Um, and that's something that the regional industries are well aware of. Um, the oil companies are also well aware of that. There's a lot of investment, a lot of research happening. Uh, for example, the numbers there for BP in Brazil. And uh, it has triggered some very interesting uh, engine technology in Brazil. The flex fuel engine technology, something that they domestically have really put a lot of time into. Um, and they've managed to get up to a point where you could have a 100% ethanol uh, um, in your tank. And they have the numbers as well, about 3.1 million vehicles uh, running at the moment. They started off by regulating that government fleets would run on this to give you your, your, your feeder market, your captive demand, and then it rolled out. And um, then moving on to our uh, continent, at the moment, very small uh, percentage of production uh, uh, in terms of global numbers. And uh, an interesting point I wanted to add, because it's specific to our dynamics, that um, ethanol is a very diverse product. It could be used as cooking gel. And some of the numbers are that this could actually just equal the, 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 the use as fuel, as, as vehicle fuel, uh, which then doubles the, the market demand for it and has very interesting effects in terms of deforestation, et cetera. I think about two-thirds of uh, cooking fuel is still uh, wood-based uh, on the continent. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of where we are in the region in, in blending rates, um, I wanted to give some numbers. Apologies, I'm unsure if it's, it's that readable. Uh, Malawi at 20%, Mozambique at 10 uh, South Africa's numbers as promulgated are between 2 and 10%, supposed to come into effect uh, October this year. Swaziland 10, Tanzania uh, possible 10% by 2030, Zambia 10, Zimbabwe 5. So it's still, in a sense, in its, in its infancy as a regional market. Uh, but the point being that to have got to this point, it means that production exists and that regulation has, has been attempted. So you already have these building blocks in place regionally. <clears throat> so then why, why develop a, a fuel ethanol market? Um, and I think this is where, just as with water, it's a nice lens to look at what we're trying to achieve regionally, what we're trying to achieve in terms of development, growth, employment, etc. cetera. Um, you see that uh, the fuel markets are quite small. Um, there's little alternative to combustion engines and uh, uh, gasoline slash petrol. Very expensive to build a refinery. So in many instances, it's just importation. Um, and you see that uh, um, the numbers for the, the, the petrol needs and ethanol uh, are then very dramatic. Um, the industry, admittedly, uh, a, a, section, a percentage of these figures are from industry sources. But still, in terms of some of the other literature and, and putting the numbers together, it looks like between 50 to 60% of new static petrol needs over the next 18, 20 years could be met using uh, a surprisingly small amount of cropland. I expected the crop number to be higher, the, the cropland numbers to be higher. Um, and interestingly enough, when you look at SADC as a, as a region next to Brazil, we actually have more available cropland uh, in terms of direct cropland. I think it was 120 million hectares versus 100 in terms of the subcategory. Um, and the jobs number and the rural economy numbers and the diversification uh, into other uh, subsectors. That's what really gets interesting. Um, those numbers, I, I was averaging some of the numbers that's, that I came across and trying to eliminate the more uh, optimistic projections, but still it, it's quite dramatic in terms of uh, the projected numbers. Now remember, this is a cross -setic. Um So, uh, to, 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 to once again return to what the, the, the benefits could be, um, I think the most significant benefit in, in my mind is what it triggers in terms of subsectors, in terms of beneficiation, industrialization. And I think this is a very useful example of where you're attempting one thing but achieving a range of things in one go. Uh, in that a targeted policy on a sector can trigger all sort of uh, uh, side effects, uh, positive side effects. It also will trigger agribusiness on a large scale, um, as we've seen with CADAP. 
Um, agribusiness is an area where Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa could really have space to grow and offer comparative advantage. Similar to Brazil, Brazil saw the opportunity and went for agriculture, commercial agriculture, um, carbon emission reduction, of course, uh, market integration. This is really interesting. This is probably the, the, the key sort of hinge for, for the whole idea. South Africa has a large fuel market, but uh, the industry can't supply more than maximum, maximum, about 5 to 8% of demand. But in the region, you have small fuel markets, but massive capacity to, to grow biofuels and supply into the South African market. You have to convince South Africa to be the anchor market, but once that's done and you roll it out through your, your uh, policy and tariff, etc., then um, we're into a situation where you have a coordinated effort. And then, of course, it will reduce the infamous South African trade deficit with the region and a fuel import bill. Um, why choose sugarcane? Uh, energy efficient, uh, capital costs, etc., and access to finance, logistics. It, the mills have to be built in the rural areas because sugarcane has to be processed very quickly. Um, it's the most highly integrated sector. And then this is the, the key point in terms of the model. It's the only commodity group with the annex to the trade protocol and where you have collaboration, public, private, and the regional secretariat, all within an established structure running since 2009, um, reports to the trade negotiating forum, working groups, action plans, strategy, the whole number. Um, and you're talking about private sector, large-scale private sector, and uh, regional structures, officials, plus national governments who all attend, all caucus, all go through all the motions with the sector. Um, so it has perhaps a, a potential as a model for other sectors or other areas of focus. Uh, for the region. And uh, significant capacity uh, in the industry and capacity to produce uh, byproducts and electricity as well. Um, and I think these are the type of things we can unlock, which then trigger all sorts of other developmental uh, space for us. So what's the key constraints, if I can, if I can land it there? Um, regulatory uncertainty. And this is very interesting, because this ties together regional regulation and national regulation. Um, it seems just too simplistic until you speak to the private sector players. And this, is, again, is something I think we miss. The private sector works in a di very different approach to public and to regional uh, uh, officials uh, and officialdom. They just won't even touch the thing without the regulatory certainty. Now, from a government perspective, you say, oh, investment strike, uh, uh, private sector reticence, uh, reticence uh, uh, we need to collaborate, we need to partner. And the private sector, the shareholders and the board say, no, no money. Uh, until we have regulatory certainty, which means blending mandates, uh, pricing. Now that then seems a, a, a bit, say you could even say creepy from a free or fair trade perspective, but the fact is they won't commit shareholder uh, funds until they have a certain market. But once you unlock that certain market and everything's rolling, then you can uh, uh, introduce a more liberalized market from a government perspective. I think that area of compromise is necessary. And then uh, key constraints uh, would be if South Africa doesn't become the anchor market, um, the idea that some governments may say, no, no, first we're going to develop and fully saturate a national market and then we'll do a regional one. So that balancing act between convincing national players uh, of, of the regional interest and, uh, et cetera, and vice versa would be very necessary. Uh, access to finance, uh, we need external investors, quite likely, Brazil, Mauritius. Um, and then just to end off, and land it, what actions would we need to make it a reality? Uh, primarily regulation at a national level. Um, and South Africa agreeing to be anchor market. Then agencies to develop the, the, uh, the concept and to put it into play and develop policy and advise the policy. And to share at a technical level between industries and across governments regulatory practice. Um, include ethanol in the existing regional sugar arrangements that are in place, the annex to the trade protocol, for example. The TFTA, as it comes up, if it has a sugar dispensation, would ideally need to have an ethanol slash sugar dispensation. Um, regional technical talks force just to make it very practical and share information. Um, carbon emission reduction funding. And um, if I can just land on, on, on a final point. Um, Having sat as secretary of this regional structure for, for five years, I think what struck me the most is that you had uh, levels of collaboration that should not otherwise have occurred. The Mauritians uh, and South Africans are fierce competitors. Admittedly, the South African multinationals own 60% of the regional market, so you have to remember that as a consideration. Other areas, sectors, other sectors that are more competitive might have more infighting. But still, there was a lot of fierce debate and, and maneuvering within this, this, this regional structure. But the interplay between the SADC officials, the government officials, the private sector officials, and looming above them, the SADC uh, ministers of trade, 
So if there was a, a deadlock, it gets referred upwards and hits the, the Minister of Trade at some point. Um, that combo within a regulated annex to the trade protocol really seems to provide a sufficient vehicle for institutional collaboration. Um, because otherwise the Mauritians and South Africans as sugar producers would not even sometimes easily be able to sit in the same room as each other. Um, and the fact that they have a detailed strategy and action plan, in a sense, is in the private sector institutionalizing what I think governments would want in the region. Um, so let me end it there. Thank you.